In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let me just say this at the beginning, in case somebody's thinking of, you know, if you leave early, you might not hear this, that there's going to be a rosary for uh, for our nation, for uh, all the needs, um, but led by Vox Vitae, um, Voice of Life Youth, after this Mass, so I encourage you to stay, and if you can't, you know, the Lord understands, but see if you can pray it at home, or even just pray a decade on the way home in your car or something, because... Uh, the Lord pours out His Spirit individually also, but especially when things are critical, uh, when people are together, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. <clears throat> and I ask at the beginning of this Mass, especially for those that were there, that I've been given regular feedback now that I can't be understood very well. I don't know if it's my voice or the microphone or you know the direction of the speaker, but raise your hand if, you, if I start to fade out or you can't understand me and I'll, I'll adjust because uh, St. Paul says that, you know, if there's no one to preach, how can they believe? And I don't mean the preaching first of all, I mean the, hearing the readings or the gospel. So if you can't hear that, that's going to make it pretty difficult today for the Holy Spirit to tug on your sleeve because there's some really difficult things that we need to work through together as a family here today, with the, especially with the image of God. What image do you have of those three persons? And check yourself as you hear the readings. Now, what, what image am I being given here of those three divine persons? Because there's going to be one that's going to come up about an enraged king who's really mad. And he starts throwing people into the outer darkness. And you've got to figure out what to do with that. And I do too, and we'll talk about it. Let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Excelsis Deo.
Let us pray for greater determination to put into practice what we believe. May your grace, O Lord, we pray at all times, go before us and follow after, and make us always determined to carry out good works. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. And as we listen to this first reading about how the Lord's going to prepare a rich feast and remove the web, the, the veil that covers everybody, you know, death, just think about Jesus, those linen, those burial cloths in John 20 when Peter and John run to the tomb and they see the face cloth in a separate place, not covering anybody's face anymore. That's the fulfillment of Isaiah 25. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples a feast of rich food and choice wines, juicy, rich food and pure, choice wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples, the web that is woven over all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face. The reproach of his people he will remove from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, Behold our God, to whom we looked to save us. This is the Lord for whom we looked. Let us rejoice and be glad that he has saved us, for the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I shall live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. and kindness 
dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. I shall A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, I know how to live in humble circumstances. I know also how to live with abundance. In every circumstance and in all things, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of living in abundance and of being in need. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Still, it was kind of you to share in my distress. My God will fully supply whatever you need in accord with his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Christ enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we may know what is the hope that belongs to our call. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus again in reply spoke to the chief priests and elders of the people in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time he sent other servants, saying, Tell those invited, Behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and fattened cattle are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away. Uh, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy to come. Go out, therefore, into the main roads and invite to the feast whomever you find. The servants went out into the streets and gathered all they found, bad and good alike. And the hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he saw a man there not dressed in a wedding garment. The king said to him, My friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? But he was reduced to silence. Then the king said to his attendants, Bind his hands and feet and cast him into the darkness outside 
where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many are invited, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, so I invite you to close your eyes and look at that image that you've especially noticed in these three readings, the psalm, something in there. Um, and try to get a sense of what's your dominant go-to image. And are there other ones that, you know, compete with that or undercut it, uh, that can't quite fit? Or is it all of a piece and, you know, you have no problem at all with the image of God? The image of those three persons, I should say, because God is a pretty abstract word. I mean, God gets used for... You know, some people believe a rock is God. Some people believe a demon is God, a false idol. Uh, some people, you know, people believe all kinds of things. We know there's one God, and that word God is like a, you know, like the zero, or I mean, or the number one or something. It's, it, it's a placeholder. What actually is the content there is three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Those are real persons, divine persons. And how do you see them? How do you relate to them? And don't look at me, because I'm not you. And it's a lot easier to hear the Holy Spirit guiding you, the Spirit of the Father and the Son, with eyes closed. You don't have to have them open for the whole Mass. <clears throat> I know that's it's, it's a challenge. And, but, but it's meant to be public and personal, the liturgy. He's speaking to you personally right now. All right, just real quick run through. And he's speaking to me personally, but I'm really sun sensitive, so this is difficult for me in my eyes. And... So I, I may just need to back up here a little bit um, <clears throat> so that I can concentrate and you're not distracted by me leaning this way and that. Uh, okay, the first reading has this image of uh, the Lord as this marvelous, super generous uh, you know, banquet master who gives abundant food and, in the pro and drink, you know, lots of wine, uh, and then the punchline, though, is that, that he's going to destroy death. He's going to take that veil, you know, that, that body bag that covers the whole person right up to the head and beyond, uh, or the sheet on the freeway when it's all the way over, and we know that means that person has died. That he's going to take away, not just once or twice, not for this person or that, for everybody, one day. And, he's, and, and who is that? That's the Lord God. Okay, so we're going to be in the, here in the, you know, in, the, in the Gospels, people are saying, Lord, Lord, to Jesus. Right, exactly. You got it exactly right. And then he comes out of the tomb. No, I mean, you don't see him coming out of the tomb, but you see his tomb, and you see especially the face cloth off to the side by itself to draw attention to itself. It's not just piled in with all the other burial garments. And Peter... And the beloved disciple looks and he sees it and it says that he believed. Well, what did he believe? He saw and believed. I don't know. It didn't say. Yeah, but, if, but you're, if I'm soaking in scripture, I'm thinking, wait a minute. There's a face cloth? And Isaiah the prophet is super, was super popular, right? So, you know, it's just echo, 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 face cloth. Isaiah 25, that's right. Okay, so that's, the, that's one image. And that's incredible, right? He's gonna, he, this person's going to destroy death, the, the bottom line of all of our fears. You know, right? I mean, even the wealthiest people, the most powerful people in the world right now, there's no record of anybody having escaped death. 
Sooner or later, it comes to everybody. <clears throat> and he's reassuring his followers that you don't have to worry about this. Don't worry about those who can kill the body, and that's as far as they can go. Worry about him who can cast body uh, and soul into Gehenna. That's who you want to worry about, he says. Okay, so right there is already a... That's a now, now, we got, now we went from the banquet master to somebody who uh, can cast body and soul into Gehenna. That's exactly what the gospel ended with, right? So in the gospel, we had, it changes from a banquet master to the, we, to the master or the king of a wedding feast. Not just a feast, not just a banquet, a wedding feast. <clears throat> Core Catholic theology says, according as follows from the gospels, Jesus says there's no marrying and being given in marriage in heaven. So there's an incredible number of Catholics that well, am I going to see my spouse in heaven? Yeah, please God, if the, your spouse said yes to the Lord, no matter how bad their life was or whatever, however topsy-turvy it went, but it's not going to be your spouse because he said that. He said that in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. To them who said, oh yeah, you know, that guy was, she was married to seven husbands. Who's going to be your husband in heaven, huh? <laughs> and he's like, hey, you're saying that because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. What? We're scripture scholars. How dare you talk to us like that? Well, you know, so anyway. So then why does he keep using wedding imagery? Not just in this gospel, but over and over. And as St. John Paul II said, other saints, you know, that the image of God as bridegroom is not one of many. It's the dominant image. So you have God as good shepherd, divine physician, mighty oak. God is our rock. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the resurrection. He's the door. He's the gate. He's the good shepherd. Psalm 23. Yeah, and he's especially bridegroom for everybody. And as proof of that, we have this week's Saint Thursday, uh, Saint Teresa of Jesus. Uh, is there, can everybody hear over there? So raise your hand if you can't. If you cannot, Oh, okay, good. <laughs> All right. Because um, this is really important. All right. If, that, if that's the dominant image that the Lord himself chooses for himself in Scripture, then, then what? Well, St. Teresa took that at white-hot intensity, and she went on record, and you can see it in her writings, and her spiritual director witnessed to it also, that she was mystically married to God in this life before she died. That was who her spouse was. And St. John of the Cross, a male, a guy, also mystically married to God. This is not just for women, right? I mean, the, it becomes a little more problematic for us guys, you know, to think of Jesus or the Father um, as our spouse. So go to the Holy Spirit. You know, he, there's no intrinsic gender in that word, in the Greek at least. Uh, but he's not some vague energy, or, you know, he's not a bird, he's not a wind, he's not fire. Those are all effects that hint at his presence. He's a real person. You're going to see him face to face one day, and you can go to him as your spouse, whether you're male or female. Because, I mean, if you think about it, you know, we got a, you know, a real small minority of people on this planet are called to the celibate life. Most are called to married life. Why is that? Because it's the best image that we have in this life of what the next life is going to be like. If most people were called to the celibate life and only a few got married, that would, be a, that would give a warped image of heaven. As, as, as if we're like unattached. You know, we're somehow happy, but it doesn't have anything to do with relationships. You know, unless you look closer to celibate's life and, you know, well, what's your life all about? Oh, it's about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's about my guardian angels, about the whole family, but it's especially about God as my spouse. Really? Yeah. You mean you actually believe that? I'm trying to live it out. Okay, so St. Teresa, St. John of the Cross, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, probably married to God. I don't know his writings well enough. St. Catherine of Genoa, a married woman, married to a military guy, married to God, while being married regularly. So this is, I mean, you know, and most people haven't even heard this or they don't take it seriously. But if you think about marriage, you know, what attracts most people? They want to start, they want a family life. 
and they want the best family life. They don't want, and, and no divorce, no dying on one another, no getting sick, um, and, 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 and a marriage that's full of passion and romance and that steady blue-white flame like an acetylene, acetylene torch that burns through steel after 50 years of marriage because they've just, the habit of self-sacrificing for the other, you know, like uh, he asked Ronald Reagan once, is marriage like, you know, 50-50? You know, you get 50% of the time what you want and she gets 50%. He said, oh, no, it's 10-90. Me 10%, her 90%. Yeah. And then you get to the point where it's like 100% because you just know that you're going to get back even more. Okay, now what do you do with the image? Now you've got a wedding feast image. You've got, you got this image, and, and, and it's an analogy, so I have to say that because core Catholic theology says, you know, uh, being with, face-to-face with the blessed, each of those three divine persons is, you know, marriage is an analogy. It's like this, and you think about human marriage in this life, and that helps you get an idea about what this next life with the Lord is going to be like, you know, and with one another as friends of the bridegroom. But it's all an analogy that falls short. In fact, it, it, it's, it, um, uh, it, it's more untrue than it is true. Yet it is true. It goes to the core of the mystery. But what it doesn't say is bigger than what it does say. So that gives you a hint of how incredible that relationship must be in heaven. And not just with the Lord, but with each other that a friendship that can be so deep that it's somehow even better than marriage, and, you know, minus the physical procreation part. That's what's waiting for us. And then, for those who are somehow, you know, either ignored the invitation, uh, beat people up because they bothered us so much about it, you know, it was just stop talking to me about, you know, Christianity. You're, you're annoying me. Uh... Are you here? Um, some went off to their farm. I got better things to do. You know, I, I'm going to be practical here. How much money can I make off of this? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Go come into a wedding? I mean, I, I could make you know a few extra thousand dollars today just by taking care of my business. And 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 then there's the guy who does accept it, and he doesn't have the right clothes. Wow, that's really unfair, isn't it? And just because he had the wrong clothes, he gets thrown out? <laughs> it says he was reduced to silence. Yeah, that's a pretty... I mean, the, the Greek there, I mean, it's, it's not totally clear. But you can... I invite you to think of it as somehow he doesn't bother, for whatever reason, to engage the master of the wedding feast. Have you ever met somebody like that? He's just there. Uh, he's, you know, doing his own thing. And somebody comes up and says, hey, um, by the way, you know, we got this mass here and that, uh, um, you know, it's like the wedding feast of the land. You want to, uh, you sure you want to sure wear, you know, flip-flops and shorts? Uh, and the person does just, blow, just blows you off, ignores you. Well, that's okay between us human beings, but this is the master of the wedding feast. So there's a hint that it has something to do with his choice, not with the master being mean, the king. Okay? That's really important. Because now I'm going to ask the key question here. So we get this image of God, uh, the Father, or the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They all work together when they work outside of themselves. And they're going to throw some people into the darkness, and there's going to be wailing and grinding of teeth, and don't worry about who can kill the body, but worry about them who can kill body, uh, can throw body. After they kill your body, they can throw body and soul into Gehenna. Worry about those people, those three divine persons. So what happened? So now we got God as the bridegroom, the good shepherd. You know, this uh, destroys death forever. And now you feel, I feel threat. I, I feel like I, can't, I don't know who this. I don't quite know who this is or who, which. Which Lord am I getting at any given moment? I mean, am I, am I, is this the one who wants to marry me? Is this the one who wants to be my good shepherd? Is this the one who's going to throw me out if I did it wrong? That's a real important question, right? Because if you 
if you don't resolve that somehow, you can't trust him totally. And then you go into Holy Communion after, after, at the end of this Mass, and I'm inviting you to let him look at you as a bridegroom looks at his bride with that desire, that delight, that gratitude. Wow. And you're wondering, yeah, but I did this, this, and this, and maybe he's looking at that. And I'm going to get aced out of the whole wedding. Okay, so here's what helps me a lot, and I'll just pass it on to you because we could, we could be tough. We, we, this is something we all work through our whole life so it doesn't get dissolved once and for all. You know, a mystery is to be lived. It's not something to be solved. And, and the mystery, St. Augustine puts his finger right on it when he says that when you experience God as angry with you, that says nothing about God and everything about your relationship to him. Yeah, if I, you know, if I have done what some of those uh, people invited to the, to the wedding feast have done, ignore, if I ignored him, if I beat up his, his uh, servants, his, his witnesses, you know, neglect my neighbor, if I uh, don't bother to you know, when he responds to me and challenges me about something, well, I, the reason I didn't have a wedding garment was because I was aware they were going to close the door and, 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 and I'm really poor. I don't even have anything. No problem. I'll get you one here. Come on. How do we know the king wouldn't have answered like that if he'd have just engaged him, right? But some people don't even engage the Lord. Okay. And, um, and, and for... Um, uh, I don't want to say it. I guess let me just to cut, cut to the chase here. Do you believe then that God throws people into hell? At the last Mass I asked that, I heard a big loud, yes. It's core Catholic teaching. No, I mean, but strictly speaking, how do you get into hell? Against your will? Because somebody threw you there? Because that's the image. I didn't want to go, but how, I somehow I ended up here. Wow, this is, and forever? How did this happen? Core Catholic teaching, nobody's going to ask that question in hell. Everybody who's in hell, and you all have to give you a good idea of this, just read C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. Everybody chooses not to get on that bus to get to the outskirts of heaven. They all make a choice. They all do it freely, even if there's some pressure on them, you know, some bad catechesis, whatever. But they ultimately make a choice. It's their choice, and then he honors it. That's what the Catholic Church teaches about heaven and hell. And then that makes it a little easier to deal with and also a little bit scarier. Well, like, who would choose hell? Well, I don't know. Look at people around you that are making, consciously have decided this action or this course of action right now, and it's definitely a, a road that's leading towards hell. They, stick in, they can still turn around. Yeah, thanks be to God. But right now, they are making a choice, and it's not a good one. We all know people like that. We do it ourselves. You know, this past week, that's why we started the Mass with the uh, penitential rite. So, I just want to leave you with that. Then, uh, if, you're, if you're starting to remember images of God as angry, can't, you know, flying into a rage like we do, just remember St. Augustine. That says everything about you and your, my, our relationship with the Lord and not his attitude towards us. He's trying to save us. But when we're against him, we experiencing, experience him as dangerous, unfriendly, angry, can't be counted on, capricious, all those, diff, all those bad things that, that make trust in a person really difficult. I mean, total trust. So now when you receive what looks like a piece of bread at Holy Communion, it's a, not a what anymore, it's a who. It's Jesus himself. And he comes into the temple of your body and he's the Lord God, I invite you to close your eyes. Forget about all the other people that are still receiving Holy Communion. Just close your eyes, because you can more easily listen to the Lord speaking inside you. And, 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 and when you get distracted, just try to imagine him looking at you with spousal desire. Because that's core Catholic teaching. Okay? And that will animate, get all of your creative energy sooner or later going. And then you'll be able to do heroic things in this crisis that we're living in, both in the church and the world. 
uh, this culture of death, because we need heroes. You're not going to be able to, to stand up to that opposition unless it's a labor of love and that you're passionate about him who's even more passionate about you. So just whatever it takes, even if you're totally uncomfortable and fight it the whole time after communion, just let yourself be loved on by your heavenly uh, king spouse who picked you. No matter how poor you are or how much you've, whatever you've done, each one of us, one college student, she said, I don't like that very much, that he, he's going to marry each one of us, then I've got to share him. <laughs> well, you know, okay, no, you don't have, somehow he'll work that out, okay? It'll be as if, as, as the saying goes, he loves us, he loves each one of us, died for us, rose from the dead, poured out his spirit for each one of us as if there was only one of us. That's how he works with, and he works with us communally. So. so come Holy Spirit, we cannot do this on our own. We definitely need help. Please deepen our prayer life. Just help us to take the next good step, no matter how uncomfortable it is, to let you love us with that intensity, that passion, that depth, um, that engagement, that totality that a bridegroom has for his bride. The Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let's now pour out our hearts in prayer for the church and for all those in need. For the church, that we may always say yes to all of God's invitations, especially when we are given opportunities to show kindness and to care for others. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all political leaders, that they will strive to have greater respect for all human life, from birth through natural death especially those who have power to change laws. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our pastor, Father Philip, that God will reward him for the nine years of good work he has done in our parish, especially in his reformation of our school, and that he will be blessed and protected as he embarks on his new assignment in Uganda. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For those who are struggling with doubts and lack of trust in God, that they will realize more clearly that the Lord is the Good Shepherd 
who will lead them all the days of their lives. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intentions of Megan Grimm, for whom this Mass is offered, and for all of us, that our faith will continually increase, making us confident that our Lord is guiding us in right paths for his name's sake, and blessing us each day with goodness and kindness, and for our personal intentions, which we offer now in silence. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for greater desire to let God show us, let the Lord show us the next good step to uh, greater truth in our image of him, healing, we pray to the Lord. Lord Heavenly Father, hear these prayers which we make in faith and with the help of Mary and Joseph. Our guardian angel, St. Therese, grant these petitions. Uh, purify us, our church, our country, to that culture of life from conception to natural death. And pour out your Holy Spirit again with the help of the rosary. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. Accept, O Lord, the prayers of your faithful with the sacrificial offerings, that through these acts of devotedness we may pass over to the glory of heaven through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For when your children were scattered afar by sin, through the blood of your Son and the power of the Spirit, you gathered them again to yourself. That a people formed as one by the unity of the Trinity made the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit might to the praise of your manifold wisdom be manifest as the church. And so in company with the choirs of angels, we praise you and with joy we proclaim. fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mysterium Fidei Mortem Tua Annunciamus Domine Et Tuam Resurrectionem Confitemur Done Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and Jose, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, 
O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you. My peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. And graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. <clears throat> we entreat your majesty most humbly, O Lord, that as you feed us with the nourishment which comes from the most holy body and blood of your Son, so you may make us sharers of his divine nature, who lives and reigns forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Amen. Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go and, go and announce the gospel of the Lord. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The St. Joseph Novena first. St. <clears throat> Joseph, protector of the family, terror of demons, and patron of St. Therese Church, you are the faithful protector and intercessor of all who love and venerate you. You know that I have confidence in you. And that after Jesus and Mary, I come to you as an example for holiness, for you are especially close with God. Therefore, I humbly commend myself with all who are dear to me and all who belong to me to your intercession. I beg of you by your love for Jesus and Mary not to abandon me during life and to assist me at the hour of my death. Glorious St. Joseph, Spouse of the Immaculate Virgin, pray for me to have a pure, humble, charitable mind and perfect resignation to the divine will. Be my guide, my father, and my model through life that I may die as you did in the arms of Jesus and Mary. Loving St. Joseph, faithful follower of Jesus Christ, I raise my heart to you to implore your powerful intercession in obtaining from the divine heart of Jesus all the graces necessary for my spiritual and temporal welfare, particularly the grace of a happy death. And the special grace I now implore. Guardian of the Word incarnate, I feel confident that your prayers on my behalf will be graciously heard before the throne of God. Saint Joseph, most prudent, pray for us. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Okay, so just a reminder again, the rosary for the culture of life, for our country, right after this Mass, and um, with the help of St. Joseph, uh, um, head of the Holy Family, pillar of family life. So the two greatest saints in the whole universe, human saints, are a married couple, minus the physical procreation. So that says a lot about our ultimate vocation, right? <clears throat>